Well, it's been a full year since we last visited everyone's favorite narrow gauge railroad in Pennsylvania. Been too long, if you ask me. We return to the East Broadtop Railroad for the annual reunion of the Friends of the EBT. It's often held in October. A lot of improvements have been made to the line since we were last up here. A lot of history has been unearthed. Let me spend no more of your time. Let's get right back to retracing the East Broadtop Railroad. Let's kick things off near the southern terminus of the EBT, Robertsdale, Pennsylvania. It's a quiet town today, sitting high up upon the Broadtop Plateau in central Pennsylvania. Up until the mid-19th century, the place was devoid of human life, save for a few farmers. Some had found veins of coal on their property, but couldn't do much with it outside of private uses. The topography prevented wagon loads being hauled to markets. Things started to change when the Pennsylvania Railroad was laid out along the Juniata River. A standard gauge Huntington and Broadtop Railroad was chartered to pull out the coal on the west side of Broadtop Mountain. But the coal on the eastern side was hard to access because of the treacherous terrain, namely Silent and Ray's Hills. When parties decided to begin operating an iron furnace out of Rock Hill, Pennsylvania, there was a strong need to access the coal of the East Broadtop. There, there, I said the name. We can pack up now. No, 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 just kidding, kidding. We're, we're, we're going to keep talking. The East Broadtop Railroad bored through the two ridges, coming to a stop at the eastern foot of Broadtop Mountain. At that time, the Roberts family were one of the only a few property owners in the region. The Rock Hill Coal and Iron Company quickly began buying up the land to establish homes for their mine workers. The Roberts name stuck to the vicinity, now appearing as Robertsdale on maps of the rail line. When the railroad officially started running trains up here in 1875, two mines were already put into operation. A third would be open following the year, with over 300 hands employed. The operations quickly expanded from there, with five mines immediately south of Robertsdale. In the early 1900s, the railroad extended a few more miles and established another mining community in the form of Woodvale. The bountiful supply of coal found underneath the ground south of Robertsdale was part of the reason the East Broadtop Railroad switched to being exclusively a coal line by 1910, as more profit was made in hauling coal than producing iron in Rock Hill. At its peak in the 1910s, over 250 houses made up Robertsdale. Roughly a thousand people lived in town, and you can bet just about every one of them were either employed in the mines, worked for the railroad, or were family to the former two types of workers. Where, where were the workers coming from? Aside from those born locally, many were immigrants. That's expected in any coal town in Pennsylvania. Initially, they came from the British Isles, but by 1900, nearly 40% of those calling Robertsdale home spoke Italian. People from Austria, Hungary, France, Belgium, and a large influx of Slavic individuals also worked in the mines. I suspect some made the move from their old homes to the new one in such treacherous terrain as a result of the First World War. That war helped the mines skyrocket to their peak production. But what goes up must inevitably come down. Two major strikes in 1922 and 1927 stalled production out of the Robertsdale mines. The Second World War brought another swell in production out of the coal mines, with the Rock Hill Coal Company even discussing plans to expand the housing in Robertsdale. But with the conclusion of the Second World War, the East Broadtop faced what many short lines had to face. A demand for coal plummeted. In 1956, the last coal train ran the length of the line before operations of the East Broadtop ceased. The mines had unofficially ceased operations a few years before that, as there became a surplus of coal in the Robertsdale yard. Now we all know today what followed next for the EBT. Instead of being scrapped, the Kowalczyk family began operating for-profit excursions, but those operations were only limited to four miles of track well to the northeast of Robertsdale. They owned the entire right-of-way, however, but did little to prevent Mother Nature from retaking the yard and mines. When the Friends of the EBT organized in the early 1980s, they came to call Robertsdale home for their growing archival collection. While their more publicized restoration work has occurred around the shops in Rock Hill, they've also been doing work to bring Robertsdale back to life. With the non-for-profit EBT Foundation announcing intentions to restore the line from Rock Hill to Robertsdale, a lot of work has already been achieved by the Friends around the old yard. What you are seeing was heavily grown just a few years ago. 
We're back to that barren look Robert still had before the railroad arrived. But don't worry, the rails are still there. They're just still covered up with some brush. They've gotten over a mile's worth of the line south of town cleared up so they can run man-powered excursions. And I mean man-powered excursions. This is the only original surviving hand car from the EBT. The friends have been starting to offer excursions, but be warned, it is all uphill from the station. The station itself is the second to stand in Robertsdale, built of concrete blocks in 1917. The FEBT also owns the old post office built in 1915. At present, the museum is housed inside the post office. The current post office across the street once housed the offices for the Rock Hill Coal Company. The Friends Group have also started offering tours of the ruins of the mine operations in Robertsdale. I was fortunate to be able to take part in an extended tour led by Ron Pearson. Pearson is a leading authority on all things Robertsdale, having spent over three decades exhaustively researching how the operations were conducted. It helps to be with somebody like Ron while you're journeying through the forests of Broadtop Mountain. There's a lot of imagination needed to visualize how the operations once appeared. This is Rock Hill number one. This is where they loaded the coal. This, right there. Uh, three football fields back that way is where the portal was. It was pulled by rope. Rope was not rope. Rope was stranded metal wire. Uh, an inch to an inch and a quarter in diameter. So you can imagine when you're going two miles into the mountain and that wire rope, how much that weighs. And then they had a winch that was pulling it up. So the winch was down there, pulled it up to a certain lay, and then it was released, and then it rolled by gravity, and there was the scale was up there on the top. Now, in front of this pile, this is the return, where the return was. Pulling them up was over here. Between the pile and here was where the trestle was. And the trestle, here, here's some of the... Uh, footers and it would cross it would cross the tr loading track and dump the coal down a chute and I think each each coal car I think held 30,000 30, pounds oh each each coal yeah. car held 30,000 pounds and each mine car held 2,200 pounds so you can obviously calculate how many uh, mine cars they had to unload to get one EBT hopper full of coal. And this was all run the mine coal coming down in the later years. Earlier, they had a coal cleaning plant up here. So you had to clean coal to run an iron furnace because rock don't burn, the rock doesn't give you any BTUs, you can't get enough heat into the system to smelt the iron. So they had to clean the coal, and they cleaned it up here. It's crazy to imagine all these loaded hoppers rolling from the mines by the power of gravity, with only brakemen hitching on for the ride to keep the cars from running away. But it's not the only simple yet efficient way in which the Rock Hill Coal Company operated these mines. Back here was where the, <clears throat> the props, uh, the railroad owned forests. They never bought wood products, so all the underground props were their cut down trees. So when they cut them down, they brought them in over here, and there's a hoist, a gantry crane type, and it would pick the logs up and drop them down into the empties that were going to return into the, uh, into the mine. And then they would take those down to the gallery and then distribute them wherever they needed them. So they were a very self-sufficient railroad. They used every raw material that was on the thousands of acres that, uh, that they owned. These are some of the foundations for the pulley system that fed into the number one portal. 
Number one was actually Twin Portals, which I presume was for air circulation. Number one was the first portal to be operated by the Rock Hill Coal Company in the late 19th century, in a day before electricity. How'd they power it? Electric motor, I guess? Uh, in the beginning, it was steam. Okay. Um, they didn't have a boiler here. <clears throat> had a pipe. Boiler was a half a mile <laughs> away. They had a overhead steam pipe that was probably coated. You say you lose a lot of energy over that Multiple, half a mile. multiple layers, I would guess, of asbestos. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and with metal around that. Mm -hmm. And uh, but that pipe went all the way down here, and the steam was provided for the winches. So, so uh, what water source were they pulling from? Up there, there's Trough Creek. Okay. So so they were probably pulling water off of Trough Creek. Now, as soon as you ask me what they did when the dry weather came in and the trough creek dried up. They got creative. <laughs> uh, well, they did have a, what was called a water train. They okay. had seven boxcars that had uh, asphalt put into the cracks oh, okay. to seal it. And then they would load the water down in Orbisonia, oh, drag oh, the train okay. up here to provide water because they had to have water for the boilers. Yeah. You know, there's no way to run a boiler without water. So, uh, so that, and they had to train a day. About every seven years, they would have enough drought to dry up Trough Creek. Okay. So they had to, those, those special cars were sit, sitting around for a long time before they got to do their job. After 1917, uh, they built a facility, at, they worked at a dynamo and everything to generate their own electricity from the coal and, mm -hmm. uh, and, and facility that they built to generate electricity. Okay. So, uh, so after 1917, all these steam things disappeared and electric motors came in. Amongst the most important things power was needed to supply was the fan houses located on Broadtop Mountain. I think it was built in the 1930s or so. Uh, in the beginning, it was steam operated, and then later on, it was converted uh, over to electricity. And it pulled the air out. You wouldn't want to push it in because that concentrates all the bad things somewhere. Not good. So the air came out, and they had young people in the tunnel and at the entrances to control doors so that they could make the air go where to, to, to the area where the miners were operating that particular day. So, uh, so they employed anybody they could employ. Of course, they probably didn't pay them a whole yeah, lot. But, but it, would it would just rotate and then pull the air out. And, and they operated all the time. You couldn't shut them down because the stuff would concentrate and then it would take days to get the air to clean itself out again. So when they built these things, they built them to just keep on and operating. And they had many of them in the mountain. So they could shut one down, and there was still a portion of it that they could keep operating. So they would move the miners to wherever they had clean air. They didn't use electric locomotives close to the base. They used mules. They used mules from 1875 all the way up to 1952 when the deep mines closed. So they always had mules. You're standing on the mule field. Okay, the barn is over here. And all of this area, this is a corral. Every day the mules came up. They did not have corrals underneath. So I imagine they had uh, extra mules and some of the mules got to rest some of the time. <laughs> so they just obviously used the number of mules that they would need. Uh, mules eventually became a problem because they weren't strong enough. The, uh, the seam of coal wasn't like you might think, nice little straight seam and everything is good. No, it was a corrugated seam. <laughs> and if the corrugated seam had too high of a uh, grade, mules couldn't pull it. 
So they would have to bring in an extra mule. So then instead of one mule pulling, they got two. Then they would have three. And eventually the cost of the mules <laughs> exceeded the cost of the value of the coal. So, uh, so they had to do all sorts of things to keep that from happening. And so, so they did go to, uh, uh, that, that, that's why they used cables and things like that, where they could bring the power in from a distance. So, uh, so they did all sorts of tricks, but mules were used from the beginning to the end. So, and the most, one of the most respected jobs on the site was the mule master, because every miner knew if the mules didn't do their job, they were going to have to do it. <laughs> and you get a bunch of human beings trying to pull a push a coal car around, you get tired pretty quick. You push so, that uphill too. Yeah, no, that's yeah, <laughs> exactly <laughs> correct. But that, but that's why the mule master was a very well respected job. And what you're looking at right now in the woods is a giant concrete foundation for the hoist house near Robertsdale number five. The largest of the ruins are near the hoist house. This is in large part due to the vicinity to the biggest producer of all the portals, the number five. Now something to keep in mind is these portals were not all isolated mining operations. They all eventually interconnected underneath Broad Top Mountain. This as in part to help ventilate the operations below. It was also due to a frequent water problem inside the dark gangways. To drain the water, a massive reservoir was drilled at the lowest point of all the mines. That way, all the water that dripped into the different portals would roll naturally downhill into the reservoir. We followed Ron through the ruins of the once mighty Robertsdale mines for over two hours. And I sense we still did not cover all of the tasks that went into sending coal up the line to customers around the country. We will definitely be making a return trip to Robertsdale as I hear they have a coal, a coal mine museum in town. I didn't get even a proper look inside the Friends Museum. There's so much to explore on the coal tours, but we must make haste to Rock Hill Furnace. But first, Ooh, another piece of rusty metal. What wonders could it hold for historians? No, 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 gotta get to Rock Hill. We have a train to catch.